So on to today's lecture, which is an absolutely fascinating one. The puzzle master delves into his own brain. The puzzle master in question is, of course, the wonderful David Astle, a writer, broadcaster, puzzle maker and self-described full-time word nerd. David's books include Word Burger, Plutopia and Rewording the Brain. And uh, if you don't have that last copy, David will be um, have some available outside the lecture after uh, today's event. David is also the evening's host on ABC Melbourne and the regular language expert on ABC TV's News Breakfast. Every Saturday, his word column, Word Play, appears in the Sydney Morning Herald, covering topics from slang to jargon, from Trumpish to gibberish. His Friday crossword in the age, appearing under a thinly veiled alias of DA, continues to torment and delight solvers, or those of us who don't solve it, let's be honest. Along with the puzzle master, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Chris Talby, head of the Flores Epilepsy Cognition Laboratory and a clinical neuropsychologist. <laughs> Chris completed a PhD in sensory systems neuroscience here at the University of Melbourne, then jetted off to spend three years studying the visual system at the Centre for Neural Science at New York University. In 2008, motivated by a desire to pursue clinical and research activities, he returned to full-time study, some would say a sucker for punishment, and completed a postgraduate training in clinical neuropsychology. Since that time, he combines his interests as a clinician scientist, focusing primarily on epilepsy. He's currently a senior clinical neuropsychologist within the epilepsy program at Austin Health, and his research at the Flory uses neuropsychological methods coupled with MRI techniques to study cognition and its impairment in disease. Chris is currently working on a project that's very exciting to us at the Flory, which is part of the Australian Government's Medical Research Future Fund Frontiers Initiative, which is a little bit of a tongue twister. Chris and his colleagues will be harnessing next generation brain imaging technology for diagnosis and treatment of epilepsy. It will be a large project, but we hope uh, will have an even larger impact on the lives of people living with epilepsy. I'm delighted to invite Chris to start, sh followed shortly after by David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along. I've chosen the somewhat unusual title for my section of the talk, which is Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, a gift lecture on magic enigma cannons in jumbled brain pictures. So hopefully the reasons for this will come clearer by the end of mine and David's talks today. So as the title implies, we're going to be talking about magnetic resonance imaging, often just abbreviated as MRI, and how it can be used to capture images that provide information about which regions of the brain are active and when they are active while we're engaged in mental activity. Before jumping into this though, I want to provide a brief kind of broad brushstrokes broad brush overview of how MRI works. Um, and it's really, you know, it really is remarkable that a machine like this can capture images like this in the first place. So the fundamental principle that enables MRI is that protons, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, behave like tiny little bar magnets. And there are billions and billions of these tiny little magnets in the body. And as we go about our normal day, they're normally just pointing in random directions, so there's no net magnetic signal. However, if a person is placed inside the strong magnetic field of a scanner, it causes all these proton magnets to align with the magnetic field of the scanner. So the magnetic field inside a typical research MRI scanner is roughly 60,000 times stronger than the magnetic field that we experience from the Earth. Now, not only do these protons line up with the magnetic field, they also rotate around it. This is much like a spinning top, or a gyroscope rotates about the vertical axis as it spins on its own axis. This rotation around the axis of the magnetic field is referred to as precession. And importantly, the rate of precession, so the rate at which this spinning occurs, depends upon the strength of the magnetic field. And the practical consequence of this is that we can use the scanner to manipulate the strength of the magnetic field across space, and in so doing, manipulate the rate of precession as a function of space. 
And by, by doing this, we can create a mapping that translates rate of possession into position in space. Now, the clever trick is that we can transmit brief radio frequency pulses at a frequency that overlaps with the precession frequency of these um, nuclei, and the protons will absorb this energy. And they'll get knocked out of alignment with the main magnetic field in the process. And when this radio frequency pulse is turned off, these high energy protons want to get back into alignment with the main magnetic field. And they do so by re emitting energy as they realign themselves. And we can measure this re emitted energy to infer the properties of the tissue at a given location in space in the brain using this, uh, the code that we've developed that maps from precession frequency back to spatial location. Now, if you didn't follow all of that, it doesn't really matter. All you need to take away from this is that by exploiting these physical properties of the hydrogen atoms in our bodies, we're able to produce snapshots of the brain like these, which provide rich detail about the brain's structure. By manipulating how we read out the signal from the scanner, we can change our sensitivity to things like water content or fat content or um, a host of other variables of the tissue. So these types of static pictures, while useful for doing things like identifying structural abnormalities in the brain, such as the damaged hippocampus that I've shown in the image here, these kind of images don't tell us about the functional properties of the brain. But what we really want to measure though, at least for the purposes of this talk, is neural activity. So how can we measure changes in neural activity using MRI? The answer is somewhat surprising. So to measure neural activity, we actually measure what is referred to as the BOLD signal. And it's called the BOLD signal because it's an acronym of the words blood oxygen level dependent signal. Now when neurons are active, they use oxygen and cause, this causes the oxygen levels in the blood to decrease. The brain's vascular system responds to this by overcompensating for the drop in blood oxygen and sending along an excess of oxygenated blood. <coughs> now, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties, and it's this difference that enables us to use MRI to measure the neural activity that drives these changes in blood oxygenation. So we're using a surrogate marker of neural activity here. And so the, you can take, the way to think about this is that with more neural activity, there's more oxygen sent to the region of the brain where that activity is occurring. And this, in turn, leads to a brighter signal that we measure from the MR scanner. So by capturing a series of such bold images in rapid succession, much as one films a movie, we're able to obtain measurements of how neuronal activity varies across time in different regions of the brain. Now, before diving into the types of things that we can actually do with fMRI, I'm going to pause briefly to orient you to the organization of the human brain. So this figure shows the surface of the brain as viewed from side on. And a useful way to orient to the brain is by using the areas that support basic sensory and motor processes as key landmarks. So vision, as shown in green here, is represented at the back of the head. A hearing, shown in blue, is represented along the surface of what's called the temporal lobe. And then our representation of touch and movement is represented in adjacent bands of tissue that extend down from the top of the head out across the surface of the brain down towards the ear. So I want you to keep this map in mind as we navigate through the slides that follow. So there's many ways I could tell you about how fMRI is used. And the way I'm going to do that today is by talking about how we use fMRI in the epilepsy imaging group um, at the Flory. So this is a group of clinicians and scientists led by Professor Graham Jackson that are based out at the Flores Austin campus, which is adjacent to the Austin Hospital out in Heidelberg. And the primary interest of our group is obviously epilepsy. And we work closely with what's called the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at Austin Health. And that's a program where individuals with epilepsy um, are investigated to see whether a neurosurgical target can be identified for the treatment of their epilepsy. Now, one of the ways that we use fMRI in this setting is to assist with pre-surgical planning. So one of the primary considerations in contemplating neurosurgery is identifying the risks that are associated with removing a particular area of brain tissue. And fMRI can be used to help clarify this risk. So for instance, we may want to know how close a proposed surgical target is 
to the area of the brain that represents hand sensation and motor function. And we can identify this by scanning somebody while they engage in a simple finger tapping task. So we just ask them while in the scanner to move their fingers. So shown here is a typical activation image obtained when we ask someone to tap the fingers of their right hand. So in this in, and in subsequent figures, neural activity is going to be coded by the color bar that I've got on the right of the screen here. So the, the, the hotter the color, so the more yellow it is, the more neural activity occurring in that region of the brain. And we can see from this figure that the strongest activation that occurs in this finger tapping task up in this sensory motor strip up close to the vertex, to the top of the head. Now that's where the representation of the hand is in the brain. We might also want to know where language is represented in the brain, so as to minimize the risks of inducing a language deficit if we were to um, undergo surgery in a particular area of the brain. So this is an example language activation map, and this is obtained by showing the participant two written, what are called pseudo words or non-words, and the person is just simply asked to make a judgment about whether those two non-words, whether they would rhyme if they were to pronounce them out loud. So we can see from this image that the task produces strong activation in the left hemisphere and very little, if at all, any activation in the right hemisphere and indeed there's even deactivation by the cool colours occurring in the right hemisphere. Now another question that comes up in the context of epilepsy surgery is where in the brain is the epilepsy actually coming from? Some people with epilepsy experience what are called focal seizures. So focal seizures are seizures that arise from within a localised region of one hemisphere of the brain. In such focal epilepsy cases, when medication has been unsuccessful in controlling the seizures, uh, we can contemplate treatment via neurosurgery. And if this is to occur, one obviously needs to know where the seizures are actually coming from in the first place. So one tool for addressing this is to record the EEG while sim simultaneously acquiring fMRI images. Now the EEG can be reviewed for bursts of, activi of epileptic activity, which is shown here with the yellow arrow up at the top, and then we can use the fMRI images to try and identify where there was activity occurring in the brain at the time that these epileptic discharges appeared on the scalp. And if such an analysis yields a focal area of activation, as shown here in the circled regions on the images on the bottom row, then this can help to localise where seizures are coming from and in so doing identify a potential target of surgery. Another way we can identify potential targets is by looking for local areas of brain in which the observed pattern of neuronal activity is unusually homogeneous, suggesting that large collections of neurons there are exhibiting tightly coupled patterns of neuronal activity. Such areas of unusually highly correlated activity are thought to reflect the action of the focal epilepsy process in the brain. So shown here is one such example case where on the far left it's highlighting regions where there's this unusually strongly correlated activity within this tight small region of the brain. So this region of the brain was identified in this manner and then you can see in this far image on the far right the dark area at the arrowhead is where a tiny bit of brain was cut out in this individual. And following the surgery, this person has since been seizure free. So far, I've, so, so far, I've emphasized the uses of fMRI where we're seeking to identify where things are occurring in the brain of a particular individual. We can also look at studies where we aggregate data across groups of people with a similar condition. So on the preceding slide, I discussed looking for localised areas of unusually homogeneous neuronal activity, so looking at small windows of the brain. Another way that we can analyse fMRI data is to examine neuronal activity across the whole brain. And we can treat the brain as a set of nodes, shown here as red dots in this caricature, and asking how do these different areas of the brain communicate with one another. This is a type of network analysis, and so you can think about it a bit like looking at a map of connections on Facebook and asking who is talking to who, and how much are they talking to one another. So we can look at how such a brain network is organised in a group of people with a particular type of epilepsy and compare it with the organisation in a group of people who do not have epilepsy. And this can provide us with clues about how neuronal communication is disrupted in epilepsy. Shown in the figure here 
is the pattern of brain network, of cha network change observed in a group of individuals with what's called temporal lobe epilepsy associated with hippocampal sclerosis. So that's hippocampal sclerosis is the lesion that I showed you on earlier, <coughs> earlier figures. And so this particular finding shown here indicates that for these temporal lobe epilepsy patients, the nodes within this area of the brain highlighted at the bottom, they have a, a much stronger tendency to talk amongst themselves than to the rest of the brain when you compared with um, the healthy brain. Now we can also look at how communication between a brain areas varies as a, as a function of what we're actually thinking about. So this is shown on the left here. Um, in another, another character to illustrate the principle. So what I'm plotting here is on the x-axis on the bottom is activity in one region of the brain and on the y-axis is activity in a second region of the brain. Now the white circles show this relationship when we're thinking about uh, engaging some kind of task like language processing and the filled blue circles show the relationship and activity between those two regions while we're thinking about something else such as like when we're daydreaming. And we can see that the slope of this relationship changes as a function of the brain state that we're actively engaged in. And it's steeper in this instance during language processing. So this suggests that region A exerts a stronger influence on region B during language processing than it does when we're daydreaming. Now when we look at this type of relationship in healthy controls and in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, we've found that there are brain areas in controls where the strength of coupling between brain regions changes significantly as a function of brain state, but where such changes are not observed in the epilepsy patients. And furthermore, we've shown that this disruption in, in and varying the strength of connection between brain areas is correlated with the degree of performance of these patients on language tasks. So I've been talking a lot about epilepsy in this lecture. Um, and as Melanie mentioned at the start, we're currently engaged in launching the Australian Epilepsy Project. So this is a large-scale nationwide initiative that will bring together clinicians, scientists, community groups and patients with epilepsy from around the country to collect imaging, genetic and cognitive data in a large cohort of individuals with epilepsy. So as Melanie mentioned, this is support by the Federal Government's Medical Research Future Fund. And the aim here is to create a resource that researchers can use to address fundamental questions in epilepsy. So addressing questions like, can we improve our ability to diagnose epilepsy when someone comes to the clinic having experienced their first ever seizure? Or can we improve our ability to predict which type of medication is going to be effective in the individual that's sitting in front of us? Or can we predict what the risks from surgery are or what the likelihood of seizure freedom is after surgery so we can use this information to better counsel patients about their options? Now to this point, I've emphasised the use of MRI to understand how patterns of brain activity are disrupted in disease using epilepsy as a model. But we can also use fMRI, use these array of techniques that I've talked about to understand how co cognition is supported in the non-affected brain. So shown here, are patterns of a neuronal, neuronal activity that are evoked during recollection of personal episodes from one's past, such as recalling a phone call that you might have had with someone yesterday, or recalling events from experienced long ago during childhood. Now in this task, the memories were probed by written questions that were presented on the in the scanner, and the onset of the questions is shown at time zero on these time axes on the left. Now, if you stop and think for a second, if I ask you to think of a memory from your childhood, something involving, say, your best friend in primary school, you probably find that, that you have the subjective sense that you initially spend a little bit of time searching for that memory, and then once you've found one that suits that set of criteria, you spend more time elaborating and visualising that in your mind's eye. Now, we can unpack this process um, using fMRI. So, the top row of images show a set of language regions that uh, respond early and transiently when we engage in this kind of task. And this probably just reflects the processing of the actual questions themselves to work out how, what, what memory are we being asked to access. Then the images in the middle row show a set or, or a network of areas concentrated on the midline of the brain that respond more slowly and they rise to a late peak. And that probably reflects activity as we're actually engaging with that memory. We've recovered it and now we're digging deep into that personal recollection. And there are also areas, again anchored on the midline, but now towards the back of the head, um, that are engaged more by recollection of recent memories 
than they are by recollection of remote memory. So we can use fMRI as a tool here to unpack all these different cognitive sub-processes that occur when we engage in a complex task like recollection. So that's been a bit of a whirlwind tour of fMRI and its uses, but I want to draw attention to some of the common themes that hopefully have come out of that. So one of the common themes that weaves through these is applications that I've discussed today is that we're using fMRI as a tool to provide a window into underlying brain function. Now, it's important to note that the images of the type that I've shown today provide only glimpses of the underlying complex neuronal operations that support these kind of cognitive um, functions. And it's these underlying operations that we really want to be able to interrogate. In other words, the images are just superficial representations that conceal deeper meaning within them. And we need theory and hypotheses to try and extract that deeper meaning. But the, brown, the brain is a profoundly intriguing puzzle. It's so insanely complex that in some sense, those of us who study it are delusionally optimistic in thinking <laughs> that we're going to penetrate its mysteries. But we continue to tinker away at this puzzle nonetheless, hoping for that moment of revelation or the aha moment when a piece of the puzzle suddenly slips into place. Like when an EEG fMRI study reveals the region from which a person's seizures, seizures are arising, offering up a surgical target and the potential for control of otherwise intractable seizures. And on that note about puzzles, it's time for me to hand over to David. Thanks a lot, Chris. And am I the only one here in the lecture hall to notice that Chris Tailby is Christ plus an anagram of Libya, which just seems <laughs> to be uh, a report coming through from BBC World uh, Services. I am that sort of person that um, I, I'm optimistically and delusional all in one because I am a puzzle solver by nature. Um, I have never been to prison, but the closest I went to jail was about uh, nine months ago now. It was early October and I went to the Flory Institute and I had to surrender my shoes, my watch. I had to fill out a, rep a report whether I've ever been shot, whether I have any bullets remaining in my system, whether I have any tattoos, do I have any splints, staples inside my uh, skeletal form. I suddenly realised that this pipe dream, as the uh, MRI pilot study was nicknamed, was suddenly taking a very real shape. To just take two steps back, this had been a long um, time aspiration of mine to get inside a tube to just to see what happens when a brain tackles a cryptic crossword. Because the fact is there has been no uh, such study in the past anywhere in the world. But what there has been is lots of research to support that puzzle solving in general and cryptic solving in particular has real benefits for the brain. But I wanted, uh, well, instead of Jerry Maguire, show me the money, I wanted to say, show me the data. Actually, show me the real data. Show me the scans, show me the pyrotechnics, show me the lobes that are working over time. Show me those Facebook connections between one lobe and another, between one neural network and another. And show me those that are quiet, those that are suppressed. I have all sorts of theories going into that tube, signing up my life away but I had never seen the pictures as yet, nor had the rest of the world. I just want to, I think it might be very helpful to explain how cryptic clues work because it will ultimately illustrate the images that you will see eventually of uh, my brain under that kind of joyful duress. That is what is called, I think misleadingly, a quick crossword clue. I mean, we could spend the next three days listing five letter animals and uh, we still wouldn't make that list complete. From llama to koala, we'd still think, well, what about a tarp here? And let's not forget an aribi while we're at it. So where's the quick, I want to know? You only get one shot and it's like a GPS that has no longitude. It just says, if you want to find Royal Parade, you just head west. That's terrific, but when do I stop? When do I know that I have the answer? When is that aha moment? There's a wonderful word that English lacks, and in fact even German doesn't have it, for that joyful ha-ha, aha moment when you get the right answer. And with a quick crossword clue, you're never quite sure until it fits into the overall pattern. 
but with a cryptic clue, you know. And in fact, someone asked me what that word might be, and all sorts of suggestions were thrown around social media from logo felicity to uh, fulfillment with a double L. But ultimately, the right answer, we all agreed, was an orgasm. Because what happens in your brain is this joyful explosion of confirmation. Because a cryptic clue gives you two roads to the one destination. It gives you the apple and you can bite it twice. It gives you confirmation from the definition and the wordplay that you are on upon the right word, such as this. This was from last week's crossword, I think, from my own. It's probably one of the easiest ones that you'll ever get, so enjoy it. <laughs> Rogue snorted rats. It's a seven letter word that we're after. And if this was a quick crossword, all you'd get would be rats seven. Now rats seven, it could be referring to traders and turncoats. It could be referring to vermin, rodents. Is it referring to rodents? Yes, it is, because if you make the letters of snorted, rogue, in other words, treat rogue as an adjective, a rogue elephant, a rogue trader, you suddenly realise that snorted can be rearranged into rodents, which means rats, which is the answer you know it is. You know this is Royal Parade number 30, because you get not just west, but you get the longitude too. This is the destination. And it's that pleasure that is the cryptic crossword. It's that game. But it's also getting back to Libya Christ. It's what Chris was saying about this idea of you're presented with these lights and shiny patterns, but you don't really know what's happening below the surface. This is the same with cryptic crossword clues. They present a narrative. Oh, rogue snorted rats. You're thinking about this, I don't know, it sounds very PG Woodhouse. Don't be distracted by the surface sense. You need to go below the surface to see through the chicanery, to understand the mechanics of how the anagram clue, as this is, is made up. When I was inside that plastic womb tomb, whatever it was, and womb tomb do rhyme, my brain tells me that, it's, I, you get to choose a musical uh, whatever music you want to choose. Now, mum would have chosen Bach or Mozart. I went for uh, Leonard Cohen. It was really unwise in the end because I'm lying in this kind of plastic sarcophagus uh, with sorts of lyrics saying, uh, you know, hallelujah or, uh, you know, let's dance to the end of love. And I'm thinking, what, what have I signed up for with no <laughs> shoes, with a periscope on my nose, with cryptic clues behind me in mirror image that I'm seeing? I have a left and right mouse. When I recognise the formula, I click left. When I've got the answer, I click right. I have nine seconds to look at the clue. If I get it before nine seconds, the clue disappears. I get a three second wait time, then up pops the next clue. I was fed 100 quick clues and then about 200 cryptic clues in the space of about an hour and a half. Was I concussed? Well, the scans will tell you that. I'm very interested to hear and see these scans. I've seen them only in glimpses. And in fact, the pilot study, as I understand, is still being processed, but there is some revelations to be shared today. Interestingly though, this was kind of, there was a performance anxiety because to be honest with you, I like to solve cryptics at my own leisure. But this was kind of solving cryptics at knife point. And uh, I have said on record that I could solve a cryptic crossword in a war zone. And I know that's probably a little bit of a callous thing to say, but my point is my focus is absolute. But my focus is also flexible enough to be suspicious of what I see. Let's have a look at this. Cook modest Arab dishes. So if I'm traveling through Lebanon and I'm thinking about what's for dinner, this sounds perfect, but it's got nothing to do with the narrative. It's a 10 letter word we're after. And again, cook is the signpost, because every anagram recipe needs a signpost to suggest flux, upheaval, change. And if you cook modest dish, I beg your pardon, modest Arab, you get a word, quaintly, and probably a little bit un-PC, that means dishes, and it's dream boats. So what's beautiful about that clue is that it's making you think that everything is culinary. Everything is to do with Peter Cavito or, or with uh, 
you know, master chef. Everything's thinking about tagine and, uh, and hummus. Forget it. Let it go. Because there is this Sri Lankan proverb, Cooper Manduka, and it means frog in a well. And it is one of my touchstone truisms. We cannot be Cooper Manduka. Cooper Manduka refers to that creature that lives at the bottom of a cylindrical home and all he can see is that circle of sky. The challenge of cryptic crosswords and of general lateral creative thinking is to stop that focal fixity, to stop just seeing that one circle of sky as being the only solution, the only pathway. Cryptic crosswords make you think in far more flexible, <coughs> nimble ways. A real tonic when it comes to the idea of neuroplasticity, as Norman Doidge would say, this notion that we will incur deficits as we age, as we uh, incur injury. And there's this, the more that we allow for this kind of neural interlinking, this grand matrix in our brain, then the more it follows that there's capacity for our brain to create new pathways around those areas that are short of capacity. I love this. Uh, this is why I love cryptic crosswords. It sounds like it should be the headline from The Guardian. Number 10 at sea, this stretch. It's very true. They're going through a lot of turmoil. And yet, can you see what's happening here? Just as dishes made you think of cuisine, in fact, it was all to do with dreamboats, this again is throwing you a curveball. Be suspicious. Don't keep staring at that circle of sky. When you stretch the letters, 10 at C this, you get a 12 letter word because that's what we're looking for. Those three, four words, with 10 being spelled out, make up the 12 letter fodder that needs to be stretched. And the answer you get is not number, but number. And a person who numbs you, as Chris could tell you, is an anaesthetist. That's the nonsense that goes on in an anagram clue. Now, I showed you three because I didn't realise at this at time, but when I was signing up for this uh, pilot study, the, um, the team of David Abbott, uh, David Darby and Sarah Holper had deliberately arranged the clues, the cryptic clues, in three recipes. Now, there was clearly method in their strategy, and I couldn't, I wasn't privy to this as I signed up, but I would imagine that the three processes had very particular areas of the brain or called on very particular functions of the brain that would give them deeper access and insights into what the brain was doing under these sorts of um, subterfuges. So that was the first I was given, anagrams, and that's how they work. The next formula was this formula. United States Triumph. Nothing to do with what's happening in the States at the moment. By now you've suspected that the surface story is irrelevant to what is happening in a cryptic clue. Every word in a cryptic clue has a role to play. And that role is often a duplicitous role. It's presenting as though it is part of a story. But in truth, behind that camouflage, it is playing a kind of more subversive role about hiding, presenting, or rearranging words and letters. This time around, it's called the homophone recipe. And the signpost that you need to look for in a homophone recipe is anything that talks about sound. And here, very cleverly, it's a beautiful clue, the word states is not just talking about provinces. It's also when we express ourselves, when we utter something. So when the word, uh, when states, when we state triumphed, we get a word meaning united. The answer is one. So triumphed is one, and when you state triumphed, you hear a word that means united, one. This is the more difficult recipe, but it was very strategic upon the Flory team to choose this recipe because it's playing around with I suppose the audio realm, and it's also there's a two-step um, requirement. You need to identify the synonym. You need to uh, sort of inaudibly say 
that synonym in your mind because I couldn't move. I had a hockey mask on, I was frozen. I couldn't just say, oh, states and triumph. You're there like a zombie, like a kind of prelude of death. And you just have to be completely astute without musing, without moving. And do you know that the anagram of astute is statue? <laughs> I found, even looking at Flory, just to give you an insight into how my brain gets bendy, I can see so much bizarre stuff in there. If you think of Flory as a homophone, it means like a floor, which is horizontal. It means like a floor, a blemish, which means imperfect. It has something like flow meets ray, so you've got flow rider meets Lana Del Rey. It has the odd letters of uh, Flory spelled fo, F-O-E. It's fly around or, O-R-E. It's ye Rolf backwards, if that means anything. If you add A-P to Flory, you get foreplay, which brings us back to that idea of orgasm. Or maybe if you put in something like us, what about we put us inside Flory? What do you get? Yourself. <laughs> That's just staring there at the Flory while Chris was showing images. I can't help myself. So, let's have a look at another homophone. Desired fashion broadcast. I'll skim through these because you're probably feeling a little bit punch drunk. I don't, I don't understand why. <laughs> when another word for fashion is broadcast, is said, is spoken, is put to the air, another word for fashion is sought, and someone, something is desired, it is sought, S-O-U-G-H-T. So there's a pun, there's a homophone, and the whole thing creates this kind of a neat click, but it's a little more work to get there. It's a li I think it's a little rockier, the path, than anagrams. The third and last is this one. It's very clever because it plays around with punctuation. And again, that precept of ignore nothing in a cryptic clue. Everything is playing its own secret part, including punctuation. And you may describe a semicolon as being a dot comma, which of course is an online trader dot comma. Sneaky, right? I know. <laughs> the third and final recipe, as I was lying in that uh, tomb, Cohen no longer in my ears, but just these procession, P-R-O-C-E-S-S-I-O-N of clues, as my precession, I've just learnt, thanks Chris, it's a word I didn't know, my little kind of protons, my hydrogen uh, particles are all spinning around, I had no idea what was going on, but I was in a happy place, even though it was alien. I was looking at the things that I grew up with. In fact, when I sat down with uh, Sarah Holper, who went through kind of my biography in a very clinical fashion, saying, your age, 57. When did you first start doing you know, crosswords? Uh, seven. When did you do first start doing cryptic crosswords? Uh, 12. When did you first start making crosswords? 16, and then I add it all up. That's 41 years. So no wonder they're my happy place. Because if I didn't have the, if I, if I was unhappy doing them, then I'm in the wrong job. But I'm happy solving them, and I'm happy making them, because my brain feels felicitous. My brain feels stretched and effervescent. This is the last one. And really, they call them the pun clue, the tee hee. In the US, they're called the Daffy Definition, but they're just a dad joke. I mean, they're just dad jokes. Contemporary art, well, that's R, because the modern version of art is R, A-R-E. Shakespeare could tell you that. So for this, where money is won, it makes you think about, well, could it be crown? No, we definitely know that it can't be crown. <laughs> uh, where could it be that you can win money? I, well, the fact is, what about if we think of one as a homophone? Uh, I beg your pardon, as a, uh, a word that has two pronunciations, um, as a heteronym. So what about if it's won? Because where the currency is the won is Korea. These are called the teehees, the gotcha clues. That, that was the third recipe that was tested while I was in the fMRI. So I was tested with anagrams, with homophones, and with pun clues. And there was a mixture of all three. In a bank of 100, then I took a breath. I think they drew me out. I could stretch for two minutes, then I went back in. A bit more Leonard Cohen, and then here we go again. Here's another 100. I think, I think they were more difficult as I went. I tell you one of the trickiest things for me was if I didn't solve it, 
I had to let it go. Because I'm like a dog with a slipper. If, if I can't get that one, for example, where money is one, five, and I'm thinking, oh, it could be crown. No, it can't be crown. That's if it'd be crown. I, I'm going to have to click something. No, I, I haven't got, it's gone. So I was then worried, oh, where's money one? While I'm looking at dot comma. So I had to very quickly adjust. It'd be interesting to see if there's that kind of, um, uh, kind of static happening in my brain where I was falling for focal fixity. I was falling for that perseverance, which can be a trap in its own making. But it's also we understand how those beautiful shower inspirations happen. If you own a problem, then you will find that when you are doing something completely unrelated, the solution will emerge. And that's because you have already hard etched that problem upon your kind of hard drive, the subconscious, which is doing a lot of work below the surface, getting back to Chris's words, so much in the brain that is happening. It is a puzzle, but unlike a cryptic clue, there's not going to be a neat answer. That's why it's such a delicious enigma. And that's why I was very keen to do this experiment, which has been called either a feasibility study or a pilot. It's not a trial, can't be if there's a subject of one, but I do believe when I did emerge from that tube, the excitement that I saw in those three clinicians, it, they had transformed. They went in a little bit sceptical about this world first actually manifesting into anything substantive or useful. When they came out, they said, wow, it's, it was almost as though we've been at the Sydney Harbour seeing the pyrotechnics of New Year's Day. What they saw, and we're about to see them shortly, was something that they had not seen uh, previously. That's the last one. Future reading material going to pot. I love it. It's, well, okay, I shouldn't say that because one of mine, but it makes you laugh. It's tea leaves, all right? And because, yes, you can read your fortune with tea leaves and they go to pot and um, it's got everything to do with, uh, you know, the kind of folklore, but it feels like it's got something to do with, um, I don't know, genetical research material. And this is the last one. I'll show you this one because it is in rewording the brain, but I do think it's a beautiful example of how a cryptic clue calls on bilingualism, it calls on history, it calls on knowledge, it calls on suppleness of mind. It's this one. Old police forces making arrest. Now, what is it? Is it an anagram? Is it a pun? Well, you don't know. That's tricky. It's pl probably closer to a pun. It also strays into double meaning. The answer is stasis, which is the physical concept of inertia or arrest, but it's stasis, old police forces. I love this clue because it makes, and also the idea of arrest, it dovetails beautifully with police. It, the delusion is brilliant. It's a uh, clue from a, a setter called Vlad in the UK for The Guardian. It's one of my favourites of last year. Because what it does for me, it illustrates so elegantly and eloquently the trickery that your brain needs to embrace to get to that orgasm moment. Stasi, stasis, arrest in two senses, two languages involved, you need to close that gap, get rid of the apostrophe, everything. And you can do that in three seconds if you are really in that kind of wonderful groove of cryptic solving. Um, and that is that. And Chris, I do believe there's a, um, we can now take some questions, I understand. And uh, any other um, images to share, but thank you very much. Well, there you go. Do you want to talk through that? Because I'd love to hear you. Uh, we can have a quick dabble. So yeah. we've just disrobed David's head. <laughs> uh, and so this is one of the images taken from David's scan. And so the three people who drove the study, I think some of them are in the audience today, actually. Uh, hey. um, Sarah Holper at the top, David Darby in the middle, and David Abbott at the bottom. And so this image represents David's brain mm -hmm. at the moment of our harness and as before we've got the hot colors represent where there was pronounced activity and the cool colors represent where there was a reduction in activity and so if uh, I was to mm -hmm. please interpret this yes diagnose away Chris. Um, one of the prominent things is in this region here so this is a sulcus a deep recess into the into the um, a fold of the brain and it's deactivated and now that region of the brain normally is active when we're engaging with the external world. 
And, but you can see at the moment that David had his aha, we've deactivated this region. So it's disengaged from the external world and it's turning inward um, in, in a mm. reflective process. And then it's also correlated with this strong activity in these medial regions of the brain. I showed you some images like this before when I was talking about memory. So that's when we're engaging um, deeply in internal thought. And just another thing worth pointing out is David talked about when he had this aha moment, he had to push a button. And I showed you hand images before. And that's the hand area up in the brain. So that's imaging. It's not only picking up the... Um, this is an important point about imaging. It's not just picking up the aha moment. It's picking up everything you're doing at a given time. So you, we might be approaching this as, is it just telling us about um, what happens when all of a sudden the words come together and they make sense? But it's also telling about, well, I need to initiate a motor act to signal that I've had that aha moment. So you, this, is, you know, this is a brief... Um, I'm sure the authors would have more to say about it at another point, but I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the ways that we go about looking at an image like this and trying to make sense of what's going on within it. Can you tell, uh, I'm interested because there was a jazz experiment that was done where improv jazz, um, it seemed to suggest that introspection uh, was actually um, suppressed, that I, I, almost like the um, self-awareness, self-awareness was suppressed and it became more of this freestyle, uh, expression of sound and permutation without necessarily being aware that you were doing it. Is, is there something that's in that at all that should suggest that I'm kind of not as aware of myself or the, the kind of the logical throne of, of the self is not uh, as active? Uh, well, this stuff here, mm -hmm. we're coming down to that midline frontal stuff where I talked about that in a memory study yeah. earlier where sense of self is strongly represented. So you're humming away there. I'm humming away. At the moment. So I'm calling Maybe on my you're patting self. yourself on the back for having <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that that's not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So, but, yeah, yeah, we'll open the floor to questions. Open the floor to questions. It's, uh, it's a kind of, we're at the, um, the threshold of some pretty exciting research, that, uh, and I'm very grateful to be part of it. The guinea pig, yep, count me in. It was a joy to be part of. <laughs>